Welcome to Truth For Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. And good day. Thanks for joining us. I am Tamira Scott. So glad you could tune in with us on this Wednesday. You're watching from Webcast One Live Studios. We thank Webcast One Live. We thank J. Michael McCoy for help making this possible for us to be on air to, with you. And we thank Crave, uh, Christians Reviving American Values Every Day. Crave, we thank them for, for joining us and partnering with us. If you'd like to partner with us because you like truth and you recognize that you can't get it, in very many places anymore without it being twisted, turned, or tainted, um, then we'd love to have you partner along as well. And you can call J. Michael McCoy at the studio here, or you're welcome to uh, try and find us. Tamarascott.com is up and running. My thanks to Ryan, our producer, Tamarascott.com. And we try and post things from the show there uh, um, when we have uh, the podcast up and just a little um, explanation of what's going on. Also, Truth For Our Time has a Facebook page. And you can follow us on Twitter. So on today's Facebook page, I already have uh, Dr. David Noble, the announcement up there. We're going to be discussing his book, The Re-Release of Understanding the Times. If you're watching online, I have those in front of me. Understanding the Times is being re-released. And if you um, are listening at the noon hour on Sunday, 99.3, we thank them for partnering along and letting this truth get out to that many more people on Sundays on your way home from church or while you're maybe at home, some of you can't get out and go to church, we will bring a little truth to you each day so that you can um, live God's word in today's world. And uh, we help you when the headlines hit home. So first I want to thank my guest. I am, uh, gosh, Ryan, I think I'm a little giddy because Doc Noble is one of those guys that, uh, man, you just, there's such wisdom there, such insight I have, I've, I learned about him back in 2002, 2001, when we brought the first Worldview Weekend here to Iowa. He was uh, one of the speakers. We were delighted to have him. And, and here was this man who had written so much and had started a camp at the base of Pikes Peak back in, I think, 1962, because he saw the way the world was going back in 1962. He saw the danger. And at that camp, it's an old hotel, And they have kids come after they graduate from high school so they can learn about all the isms before they go to college and get hit with them. It's great training. Still happening today, though Doc has somewhat retired. He's passed it along to Dr. Jeffrey Meyer. But it's still a great training for your kids to go today and and learn what they're going to get hit with and how to uh, confront it, uh, not with a frontal assault, as Doc Noble warns these kids, but but how to deal with it and, and then gives them from the experts, whether it's uh, you know Dr. David Minton at Brown University or uh, Gary Gakukul with Stand to Reason or all these speakers from wonderful organizations, universities, the experts in the field. So your kids have good resources, a textbook or a notebook that they've helped write with the notes. When they get to college, the resources are there fresh in their head and they can combat what they're hearing that they recognize is not true. You do it too when we're at work, when we're listening to the news, when we're having a conversation with friends over dinner. You hear something and and you know in your gut it's not right, but you don't always know how to confront it or what to say in response to it. Sometimes we don't want to hurt a friend's feelings. We want to do it politely. Other times we're, we're afraid we're out of our league, so we don't want to combat it. Doc Noble can help you through those times, and that's why I'm so excited to have him on air with us today. I will tell you quickly, my son, good kid, awesome kid, never, never rebelled. Um, you know, was he typical? Yeah, did he, he, he wasn't perfect, but he was a great, great kid. And we kept telling him, you're going to go to Summit Ministries before you go to college. And one day he sat down in the living room and he said, I don't want to go. I love you guys. I don't want to lose two more weeks with you before I go to school. Why are you sending me? If I'm mad at you and I never talk to you again, are you going to send me anyway? We said, yes, we are. We'll hope you get over it, but we're sending you. We're not going to risk you not having this information. We picked him up in the van on the way home. And by the way, we went out to Manitou Springs. We spent a week there as well in the cabins on the campus of Summit Ministries. We were ministered to in the sessions we went to. It was a great, one of our best vacations as a family. And on the way home in the van, my son was nobleized. He had the phrases of Dr. Noble. And we listened to the, um, 
dialect, if you will, of Dr. Noble the whole way home. And as he went to school that next week, he was in school two days before he called and said, Mom, Dad, I am using my summit stuff. I don't know if I'm going to make it here till Christmas, but I'm using my summit stuff when the professor in our religion class told us we didn't have to believe in Jesus Christ, the resurrection, to, to, be, to be a Christian. He said, I saw all these other Christian kids sitting there smiling. They had no idea how to combat this, but I did. Thank you. Or when they had the ceremony and all the professors walked through in their robes, he said it was more pump and, steps, pump and circumstance than my actual high school graduation. And all they wanted to tell us was that there was no absolute truth. I was the only one to speak out in our small group. So Dr. David Noble, thank you so much for taking time out to join me today. Well, Tamara, I don't know what I'm doing on this line because you can carry this whole thing to tell the truth. That was a great summary of Summit Ministries, and it is true that I'm uh, practicing retirement right now. Uh, from the summit, but I have come up with a great definition of retirement, uh, and that is that I don't have to meet payroll every two weeks. So anyone that has had the privilege to meet payroll knows exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) And personally, I don't think anyone should be voted on for any public office unless they've met a payroll someplace along the line, because it changes one's perspective like you can't believe. But uh, Summit Ministries is, uh, and still is for me, uh, an, just a, a fantastic educational experience for Christian young people. And um, the and this summer, for, for example, and I've been now away from the summit um, for what three or four years, I guess. I just go once. I go once. To, I lecture one day out of every session, and that's about it for me right now. It takes me a day to get there, and, and I'm living in Prescott, Arizona, and it takes a day to get back, so it takes a while. But anyway, I, I really enjoy I enjoy the young people, and the young people, they haven't changed one bit tomorrow. They're just, these kids are really something. Uh, the big change, I think, is uh, the amount of homeschoolers that are in these classes. Usually, in the past, the homeschoolers would monopolize the first and the last sessions because the public schools weren't out at those times, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, now, here we are in session four, five, and six. I finished those already. In fact, I only have one more to go this year. But I would say, I would say, over fifty percent of the of the students are homeschoolers right now. And the truth is, that's going to continue to increase. You're right. And not only do we have our program in Manitou Springs, Colorado, but we also had a full course in Tennessee at Bryan College. We had over 300 students there for this for the two-week session there. And then we started a new one at Biola University campus. And uh, Josh and Sean McDowell are the ones that are really helping us there. And uh, we started, I think, the first time there with 40. This year, we had nearly 160 students, and that'll just continue to grow, too, as the word gets out that these two weeks are very, very important in the life of these young people before they step foot on any campus. And when I say any campus, I'm not just talking about the University of Iowa or Minnesota or Wisconsin. I'm talking about our Christian schools as well. And it's important that they just get a grasp of the uh, importance of a good, basic uh, Christian education, and I think all the roots are there at the summit for these two weeks. So you've experienced it with your son. I still remember him, by the way. (laughs) And uh, just we've had wonderful students, wonderful students over the years, and they're they're just there as well. I look at them, I listen to them, and we still have those front porch chats, you know. They come up with all these questions, some of them. I don't even know what they're talking about on some of these things. They're talking about some film or something, and I've never heard of it because I read books instead of watching it, you know. But it's been a, a great experience for me. So on as far as your listeners are concerned, uh, anyone who has a son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, mm-hmm. 
and they're thinking of going to any of our institutions of higher, what they call higher education, by the way, I put higher in quotes on quotes, right. uh, they need to consider at least two weeks at the summit, just get away from everything. You know, it's just up there in the mountains, and it's just a great time to reflex, and they can, they can just sit down and start thinking about some serious things for the first time maybe in their life. It's an amazing experience. Uh, my daughter went there as well. My son did the uh, correspondence worldview uh, courses through. Uh, somehow he got credit uh, through the through Summit, I believe. My 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 youngest son. But we had three. We didn't know about it in time for my oldest, and I regret that so much. But the teaching was phenomenal. And you mentioned the front porch chats. Those. <laughs> Even when we were there as adults, getting just to sit in and listen. That? Oh my goodness! It was truly, Doctor Noble, one of our best family vacations, and that tops Disneyland. It was one of our best family vacations. <laughs> well, we do sort of act clownish once in a while, so we can give Disney a little run for their money. But you know, those front porch chats are really, they're really interesting because. You know, these kids, you know, come from all over the country. In fact, they come from all over the world right, right now. You can't believe how many are coming in from other countries. And they come up with questions, and you just look at them and you just think to yourself, they can't be serious. <laughs> but they are. But they are. And, it, and these are such deep, tangled truths. And here's the deal, and, and you know better than I. You've worked with kids much longer than I. But these kids, I think, can tell when they're being fed baloney. They resent the um the just the some of the stuff that's thrown at them many of them even though they're in two parent homes and many of them coming from what we call christian homes are left to their own vices 3 to 5 after school they don't feel like they're the priority in their family's life or they're forced to be on a performance mode all the time whether it's sports whether it's school and so a lot right. of these Good kids point. yeah a lot Good of these point. kids just we don't speak to the soul of the being anymore it's yep. It's the Pavlov's dog theory, and here's your reward. Do this now. You must do this. So you really, I think, are nurturing the individual, where many of us should be as parents, but have forgotten how. Over decades of government telling us to put them in preschool, which, by the way, to our listeners, I strongly oppose. And you heard Doc Noble talking about the increase in homeschoolers, and I think I was just reading an article about the. I think it's like 7,000 increases in, in, in the number of increasing um, homeschool students in Florida. This will happen more really? and more. Yeah, really? yeah I, now don't quote me on that. Go find it because I just, you know how you read things in flashing across your phone? And so I'd have to pull that one up, but I, that's what I believe I saw. I know that uh, Carolinas ha- have experienced a growth. This Common Core that's coming through is just horrendous, not only in... Common in, Core is going to make the homeschool movement explode. Absolutely. It is. We've seen it. And, and, and not just that, I believe also we're, we're, what we're seeing with the agendas. You know, I was on air saying this back in, the, back in the 90s, Doc, that if we went with some of these agendas, we would have sixth grade boys being able to walk into fourth grade girls' bathrooms, and I was poo-hooed. Guess what? 16 states are now dealing with just that issue. Right. And California led the way on that. So they call it a red heron. And I, if, if I were to write a book, Doc, and I, I, I'm not very good at it, I, I, I just don't get it done, but it would, one of them would be titled right now, When Red Herons Happen, because, because it's <laughs> happening all across the nation. <laughs> well, that might not be a bad, bad title for the book. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a> chapter. <laughs> so, yes. Um, now we're well, our young people are the game. There is no doubt about it. I, I just wish that our churches could figure this thing out, right. too. Uh, the greatest mission field for the church is not Africa or China or Timbuktu. Uh, and that's in Mali, by the way. But the greatest uh, mission field, their youth. Their youth. And if we lose a generation, you know, it's all over. Even the Christian faith moves from generation to generation. We're generational creatures. We're born and we die. And um, if we don't pass on our faith to the next generation, it dies. There's no doubt about it. We'll be right back. And right now, some of our youth groups... Yeah, 
Well, Doc, we've we'll, we got to go to our break. We'll talk about it on the air. We'll be right back. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you. Sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, I'm J. Michael McCoy, and about 20 years ago, I went to a used car salesman by the name of John Hewitt. He had a little shop over there on North 2nd Avenue called John's Auto Sales, and I bought a car. I found that experience to be one that I had never had before from a used car salesman. He was honest, he was dependable, he had integrity, and he did what he said he was going to do. Well, over the years, between my kids and grandkids, I've purchased seven vehicles from John's Auto Sales. And last month, I asked him to be a sponsor. I can tell you about their huge selection. I can tell you about their years of experience. I can tell you about their honest integrity. But all I really need to tell you is that I bought seven cars, and you can trust them. John's Auto Sales, 5435 2nd Avenue, Des Moines. You need a good ride when you hit the trail. Trust the man with the cars, and he goes by the name of Big John. Big John. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to Truth for Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. And thanks for staying tuned. I have on line with us Dr. David Noble, N-O-E-B-E-L. Dr. David Noble, you can follow him on Twitter. You can find his books. Mind Siege was the book that really put it in perspective for my husband. He started reading it one night about 8 o'clock and did not put it down, did not go to sleep until he was done reading it. Then the other book we're talking about today is Understanding the Times, and it just somewhat takes us through all those things we're dealing with. Doc, we have so much coming at us today. Parents are weary. Uh, we have bills to meet, schedules to keep. And then beyond that, as um, our first lady is concerned about with what our kids eat in school, nobody seems to be paying attention with what they put into their heads. Right. So, you know, whether it's... Uh, Whatever issue you want to take first, we've got the the Planned Parenthood videos. That sixth one came out this morning. I've got it on the Truth For Our Time Facebook page. We've got marriage. We've got transgendering. We've got folks wanting to threaten folks like me if we refuse or mistakenly call someone by the wrong sex anymore. Uh, well, sex is no longer uh, a politically a politically correct word, you know. Uh, they're even in the applications now for college, they don't use the word sex, they use the word gender. And then they give you about five or six boxes that you can check off. I always tell our students, why don't you add five more? I mean, or make it a full dozen, you know, I mean, 
if, if you're in love with a tree, you can always put that down. I'm sure there's a name for it someplace. It, actually, it is. It it's is. called objectivism. <laughs> you're absolutely <Yeah>. right. <laughs> <laughs> so gender is the key word. Biology is out. Sex is just male and female. You know, I mean, when a baby is born, they don't. They even the doctors. They're not. They're, the doctors really. I have to give them credit. They haven't really bought into this thing very much. And uh, when a baby is born, they just have check off, uh, male or female. In fact, the first thing determined, you know, at conception is the sex of the individual. So they know by DNA if it's male or female. So even when the transgenders try to change it, there's <laughs> uh, our friend Jenner <laughs> is still a male. I mean, he can cut off and add as many parts as he wants. You know, it used to be the famous slogan, I think, parts is parts, but... Uh, it doesn't make any difference. All you do is you just check and you can tell if he's male. You can tell if the if, DNA uh, doesn't if change. Female. The DNA yeah. doesn't just, change. Just correct? the DNA will tell you that. But now biology is taking a uh, a back seat, and this is this is interesting, Tamara. You um, same sex marriage. Well, let's let's go further back. Homosexuality uh, does not fit the Darwinian pattern. You know. And the Darwinian pattern, according to the scientists today, is supposed to be gospel. And you're going to notice now in this election that's coming on, uh, in fact, uh, Scott was already hit with this question, you know, of whether or not he believed in evolution. Remember when he was in London, and he put it off, and he said, hey, I'm running for president. That's a discussion for someone else and not this time, which I thought for him at that point was great. But uh, there is a good uh, response to this whole thing, too. But um, right now, uh, the, the, the science of, uh, if biology is considered a science, and biology is based on Darwin's theory of natural selection plus mutations, homosexuality doesn't fit the pattern because all natural selection works on is, is reproduction. And if you don't reproduce, you're not going very far. And homosexual and homosexuals don't reproduce, so they have they have reached the dead end of the scientific model of Darwinian's theory of evolution. So, in a sense, uh, if you're uh, if you're going to debate this with anyone, uh, you're going to have to decide: Are you going to be for science? I mean, the liberals, by definition, you know, their their whole scheme was: Why, well, you Christians, you're just people of faith. We're people of fact. Right. We have science on our side. Right. Well, I have news for them right now. Most of them are pro-homosexual, and they don't have science on that side if, in fact, they claim that Darwin is their gospel. So this is something that our young people need to catch on to, and when they step on these campuses this fall, they could have the time of their life to tell the truth. They could be in a class, and they could have more fun than a human ought to have. <laughs> so but they just need to know a couple of things. And the truth is, I even have uh, the latest copy of of uh, one biology uh, quarterly, and it, it actually comes right out and says we we don't have any scientific proof that uh, that homosexuality is involved in any gene or chromosome or protein or whatever. So they have their they have their problems. And a couple of years ago, 2012, in fact, BBC ran an article uh, or ran a, a program. Uh, and then they put it in a magazine, too. I think it was called BBC Magazine or BBC News or something like that, and admitted that uh, homosexuality, we don't know where to put it into the Darwinian scheme of things. So when you find a British publication mentioning that, you know that there's real problems up front. Absolutely. And as you're saying, they usually used to throw at us that we were people of faith, they were people of fact, or that they went with science and not feelings and 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 and, and our... They would always say faith derogatorily. But as you're pointing out, the DNA doesn't change. So where's the science there? The DNA does not change. And I find it strange. I just find it ironic. And it's not even almost, it's risky to even discuss it because they try and create a social jihad when someone even ventures in here. And, right. and uh, you know, on right. social media, you are you are quickly punished. And, and, and if they can, they'll get it into your workplace where you are reprimanded and possibly suspended and even fired for even talking about something like this, but um, uh, if 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 we're going to go along with this, you know, let's let's confront confront hypocrisy, because it's the left and the progressives that are always 
throwing the cards, whether it's the black card, the sex card, the female card, the war on women. You know, right now there's a movement by 50-50, excuse me, by 2020, the year 2020, they want 50-50 in the House and U.S. Senate. They want 50% male and female by the year 2020. Well, my, my thought is, how can you do that? You don't even want to call somebody a sex. That's, right. a, that's a changeable right. thing every day. <laughs> And I, I had a reporter right. just call me just yesterday as the Republican Party ready to nominate a woman. Well, you know, obviously we were ready to nominate Elizabeth Dole when she w- ran in 2000 and Michelle Bachman in 2012 was an excellent candidate. So those are just, you know, silly questions trying to, to sidetrack us. But again, if we're going to go with the way of the left, why do you even ask? That's right. That's a very good point. And this is something that our young people need to hear and need to know. Um, now, in the latest uh, uh, newsletter from Dr. James Dobson, he has a great summary of the whole issue on same-sex uh, marriage, in which he points out that really the issue, uh, even for the homosexual community, is not marriage. And let, let, let's, let me say something up front, because this will be the most controversial, and if you're going to have to delete anything from the broadcast, this will probably be it. <laughs> but uh, the LGB uh, TQ family is supposed to represent the homosexual family, which is no more than 2 to 3% of the total population of this country, by the way. Right. And yet the Q, the queer part of that denominator, mo- I don't know of any Qs that really are for same-sex marriage because they don't believe one to one. They don't want one male and one male, or one female and one female, in any kind of reunion because these guys are much more into many partners. They're they're into, uh, well, in a, in just a brief period of time, one homosexual could have ten, fifteen, twenty partners, and they don't want to be tied down to any marriage where it's one to one, and you got to be faithful to one. They say this doesn't work. Well, that cute part of the of the family is a huge part of the family, and that crowd never was for same-sex marriage. They just let their L and their G's work with it, and um, and they said, good luck, and we'll see you later. They never thought it had a ghost of a chance to pass. So that so, could be... Uh, they're out there by themselves wondering, <clears throat> what in the world is going on here? But as Tim Dobson points out in his newsletter, the marriage part is just a minor part. The homosexual revolution uh, and, and the marriage is just a small fraction of the revolution. Uh, because they are going to affect everything. It isn't just marriage, but the same-sex marriage passed by the Supreme Court is going to affect everything in our in our culture, including education. Now, right now, for example, and they they were even doing this before same-sex marriage was uh, stamped with its uh, Supreme Court approval. But they were already down in kindergarten, first, second, and third grades, teaching the younger uh, innocents. Uh, you talk about child molestation. This, to me, was child molestation. When you start teaching first, second, and third graders about the glories and the wonders of the homosexual lifestyle, you know you've got a problem. And, that, and this is our public education. In fact, the, uh, the Obama administration put a flaming homosexual in charge of a great portion of our public education until they, they just got too much for him. His name was Jennings. They got too much for him, and they had to get rid of him. But uh, look, this this thing uh, this is very serious stuff, and uh, whoever's listening to us right now needs to read the Dobson newsletter for this month and see where he's talking about how it's going to affect our law, it's going to affect our Christian schools, it's going to affect our home schools, it's going to affect our colleges and universities, on the dorms that are presented on our college campuses. Therefore, male and female. But if they don't agree now to put two males or two females in these dorms, they're going to have a lawsuit that you can't believe. They could turn the whole college upside down and put it out of business. So he said these things are all on the horizon. They're coming on. The game plan is already made. Everyone thinks that because they won the same-sex marriage debate that it's all over. No, no, no. That's just the beginning. It's pro- in fact, it might not even be the beginning. It might be the beginning of the beginning. And the, the end of it is way down the road and the game plan is to destroy Christianity. That's the game plan. That's it. Because they contend that Christianity has been very tough on the homosexuals for 2,000 years, and now it's time to get back at this whole thing and show them who's really boss. So we're in a very uh, explosive cultural revolution. 
You talk about war on women that you just mentioned, Tamara. This is a war on the culture. This is a war, well, let's put it this way. This is a war on Western civilization. That's right. And Western civilization is in bad straits right now. In fact, I sometimes look at it and I think to myself, I don't know if I can survive another generation to tell the truth. But uh, these are very serious times. And so, Doc, we've only got two minutes left before our break, but you brought up the word Q, and here in Iowa, the Q is for questioning. It's not queer, it's for questioning. And, of course, they've added one more letter to the alphabet, uh, the A for alliance. And I think there's an Oh, they've got another. uh, Well, Tamara, their alphabet goes on. It's (laughs) Q-A-I-A now. Q-A-I-A. And the I is now intersexual, and I looked it up, and I couldn't even find a definition of it, so I'm not sure what that means. I mean, the, and why, what's, why not just keep on trucking? Put a T in there for trees or whatever, you know? <laughs> and, and here's the deal. If you don't have a plumb line, if you don't have a, an absolute truth, then you are all over the place. That's true. It, it, you know, that is true. If, if you're out there camping somewhere and you go to tie your tent down, you know what happens when you don't tie it down. It's, it's all over when the wind blows, and that's exactly what we're seeing in our political movements, in our, in our movements in general, in the schools. So, Doc, you mentioned the word flaming homosexual. That's going to be a lightning rod. Here's what I don't understand. I'm just going to ask a question. For all those haters out there, I'm asking the question. And, and we've got to go to break here in just a few seconds, so um, you can think about it over break. If homosexuality is something to be, something to be celebrated by the left, by Hollywood, then why does it need all of these protections? And if it needs these protections, then why do we promote it as an everyday lifestyle and a regular choice for our youth? Good, good point. We've got to go to question. We've got to go to break. We can talk about that when we come back. We'll also get into some of the isms your kids get when they get to college as you're preparing to send them out the door. Uh, thank you for staying tuned. This is Truth For Our Time. I'm Tamara Scott. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fix them the problem today. If they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. (laughs) We have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing. We have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. We promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. 
if you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call, we're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. Welcome back to Truth For Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. And thank you for listening. And I am just so thankful to be here. My thanks to J. Michael McCoy, Webcast One Live Studio, our sponsors, uh, uh, Christians Reviving uh, American Values Every Day, Crave, Christians for America. And um, if you want to get in touch with us, either Truth For Our Time Facebook page, TamaraScott.com, info at TamaraScott.com, I'm thrilled to have Dr. David Noble with me, N-O-E-B-E-L, Dr. David Noble. And you can do a search for him. You can find his book, Understanding the Times. I have it underneath my notes right here. We're talking about all those things facing our kids today and facing us as adults, those things that we're not sure how to handle. And I just asked him a question before we went off air. You know, if, if, if homosexuality is truly uh, just something that happens, in, and then, then why, when do we have to recruit it in our kindergarten through uh, college level um, educational system. And, and if it's just an everyday thing, why does it need all these special protections in, in the civil rights? So, um, you know, e- either it is good or, or let's, let's understand what it, what it's not. Um, doc, when kids, when parents drop their kids off to school, it is such a, an emotional event in itself, leaving them there, uh, new surroundings for them, uh, I don't think most parents understand what happens at school anymore. I don't think they understand all of the uh, pushes towards drinking from the school itself. They'll deny that. But I, my daughter had emails from people who were paid by the school, and she was a minor, asking her to come to this party, figure out if you're a uh, obnoxious drunk, a quiet drunk, a loud drunk, a shy drunk, right? And, and uh, at her first night, we dropped her off. First night. And I'm usually pretty perceptive, but man, I think I was trying to suppress my feelings that day and just kind of get through all of the, you know, be brave. And her dad said, I'm not leaving. There is something going on with this roommate. I am not leaving. Well, before the day ended, we figured out that her roommate was planning on having her boyfriend come spend the night that night in the same room with my daughter. My daughter was, I was so proud of her doc. She had just come home from summit. She was so calm. They didn't want to hear from parents. We had to be quiet. She was so calm when they, I mean, this, this was a discussion we had to have. Security was there because this was her roommate's room too, and she had the right to do what she wanted to do. Not until it was said, if I see someone staring out the window, staring in the window at me, should I call security? Absolutely. Then how much more when he's in my room and a stranger and he's staring at me in my night clothes? How do you expect me to feel safe? And what is your liability? Only then did they care. Otherwise, they went on to tell us that that roommate, her boyfriend, could stay three nights. That's the rule. He could stay three nights in a row. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, you know, what you're saying right now brings back a lot of memories. My granddaughter went to um, a big school out east, very famous in North Carolina. And uh, her roommate uh, brought her boyfriend into the room. And so my granddaughter had to leave the room and study in the library or in the hall. Right. And his name was Yesu. So she used to call her mother and say, Jesus is in my room. Jesus is in my room. (laughs) (laughs) And my my daughter thought, yeah, I bet he is. (laughs) I bet he is. So what and do you that s- went on for a whole semester? So, and then you know what's interesting, Tamara, is when you go and complain right. to the uh, to the po- to the powers that be, you're the victim. Yep. I mean, you're, you're the, the problem. Enemy. Yeah, you're the problem. You're, you're the problem. You are the problem, and therefore you need to go to a special class and get some re-education there, so you realize that to have Yesu in the room with your roommate, well, that's just perfectly normal, and uh, and in fact. There wasn't anything to protect her from anything because they were, they were involved in some very important things, you know. And she just had to go and get out of there. And she and but, the, here was the uh, phrase: she made it through that school in one piece. And she told her mother, she said, "Grandpa, that's me now. Grandpa was right all the time, Mom." <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing when they figure that out, right? And here's what they tell the students: 
You can't push your values on other people. And thankfully, my daughter had just been to Summit, and she said, I'm not. I wish you wouldn't push yours on me. You're the one forcing me to take part of something I'm not comfortable with. So because she'd learned well, all the I, arguments. I think I wrote you and told you that my granddaughter just got her law degree. So she has now got her JD and she just passed her um, bar. So she's a full-blown lawyer in the state of California. I don't know what that means right now. She's, I don't know what she's going to do with Moonbeam, but we'll see. Right. And if she's going to fight any of these things that we've been talking about, she'll have good work security because there's so much um, crazy things happening in Oregon, I mean, in California, if nothing else, just the regulatory. There are 435 regulatory agencies, Doc, and they are the ones who are making law, not passing it legislatively, making it through enforcements, regulations, and taxations, and it's costing the average household $14,000 a year. That's what we're dealing with. So maybe she can fight some of these isms. Let's talk. Let's talk about what's, what what do you say to parents? How, how, what do we handle? What's the biggest risk to us? today the biggest risk is losing your children there you go i've always talked this too as i mentioned earlier the greatest mission field for the church are their young people the greatest challenge for the parents are their young people and we can't afford to lose any of our young people right now and therefore we have to come up with uh, a strategy and we got to be brave, and we got to uh, lay down the law, and we got uh, look look at Ben Ben Carson, and what his mother uh, did for them, and and he and he says that she couldn't even read or write at that point, but she forced those two kids, her two boys. What did they have to read a book a week? Was it or I thought it was maybe two whatever. books a week. I'm not sure. Was it a couple books a week? It was a couple books a week. And he said he just couldn't stand that and stand that and why she was so stupid and why she was so dumb. Now it turns out, he says, she was the smartest thing on wheels and she had this game plan already in advance. So that's where I'm coming from, too. I think parents need to have a good game plan. uh, And if they want to, if they have to send their young people off to public schools, then they have to homeschool them at home when they get back off of that. So when they get home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they have to hit a book that is on the same subject from a Christian point of view. And they're there, by the way. In fact, you mentioned uh, Understanding the Times. Uh, it has been updated, Tamara, and it's, and it's really well done. Jeff did a great job. He and his team put – they just upgraded uh, the Understanding the Times that came out originally in, in uh, 1991. And then it uh, – and in those days, it only had four worldviews. I added two more later. I added postmodernism and Islam to it later. So now there are six worldviews in the work. And each worldview, if you take your time, and I don't care who it is, uh, the, uh, I've had, I had a, I remember um, uh, I, was at, I was speaking someplace, and some little girl came up to me and she said, I just want, I just want you to, she says, thank you for writing your book. And I looked at her and she was just tiny, I thought. And I said, what book? And she said, well, Understanding the Times. I said, Understanding the Times? I said, honey, that's 900 pages. I don't think you could carry it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how old are you? And she said, I'm 14. I said, you're 14, and you read the book? She said, I read every page. Wow. I said, you read every page? Did you understand it? She said, sir, I understood every page. Wow. Whoa. That took me back about a generation. I thought at 14, I could hardly play yo-yo. And here she's going through a 900-page book at 14 years of age. So we're undercutting our own young people. Yes. Sometimes we just um, misjudge them. They are capable of tons more than we even think possible. Remember William Carey way back when? William Carey uh-huh. was the father of modern-day missions. Mm-hmm. When he was eight years of age, his daddy died. He had to go to work. He had to support, get this, eight years of age. He had to support his mother, his brother, and his sister. And while he was making shoes for a living at eight years of age, he started to uh, learn uh, all the European languages. At the, when he was 14, Tamara, he had a, he could read, write, and speak fluently all the European languages. 
And when he became a missionary and went to India as a missionary, he learned 40 more languages over there. So if, if the, and these, we're talking generations ago, and we're supposed to be the brightest generation on God's green earth right now, right? You hear, well, our generation, our kids, they're, they're the brightest, they're this, that, that. We'll be right well, back, you, well, Doc. Compare- we got to go to break. Save it. We'll be right back. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, I'm J. Michael McCoy, and about 20 years ago, I went to a used car salesman by the name of John Hewitt. He had a little shop over there on North 2nd Avenue called John's Auto Sales, and I bought a car. I found that experience to be one that I had never had before from a used car salesman. He was honest, he was dependable, he had integrity, and he did what he said he was going to do. Well, over the years, between my kids and grandkids, I purchased seven vehicles from John's Auto Sales. And last month, I asked him to be a sponsor. I can tell you about their huge selection. I can tell you about their years of experience. I can tell you about their honest integrity. But all I really need to tell you is that I bought seven cars, and you can trust them. John's Auto Sales, 5435 2nd Avenue, Des Moines. You need a good ride when you hit the trail. Trust the man with the cars, and he goes by the name of Big John. Big John. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to Truth for Our Time with your host, Tamara Scott. And thanks for staying tuned. Doc Noble is my guest, Dr. David Noble. If your child has had the blessing of going to Summit Ministries, uh, you know uh, the phrase, you can put it in your pipe and smoke it. And uh, <laughs> we're even hearing some politicians say that now. So, Doc, I think you're having a good influence. We're talking about our kids. We're talking about them going to college, what you need to know. Um, Doc, one of the best pieces of advice you gave us was to have our kids call us every day, to talk to them every day, to not lose contact with them. When uh, the kids go to school, they have these orientation classes. And what most parents don't know is often those orientation classes are to separate those values that you would raise them to have, to make them feel like they would be strange if they still believed what mom and dad believed or that they needed mom and dad in any way. And Doc, you were talking about uh, William Carey, and it's not just William Carey. Um, Trumbull, one of our founding uh, fathers, I think read the Bible through by the time he was four. Uh, He had won a a contest um, in Greek, I think, or Hebrew against his own pastor, I believe, and studied and was able to enter college, oh gosh, was it 12 years old? But they waited till his friends could go at 14. He had had passed the entrance exam. He became ambassador to Russia when he was 14. So so it's not, you're you're absolutely right, we are undercutting our kids. Uh, It was explained to me that the term teenager didn't come around until the early 1900s or late 1800s. And that was almost a term of rebellion. And since that time, we have seen, we have, we have totally ruined what kids could do and how they could be productive. You're talking about William Caring have a job when he was eight. My parents got married young. They had two kids. They had a home. They were productive members of a community by the time they were 20. Now, kids are in 26 on their parents' insurance living in the basement. It's, <laughs> it's not that kids, and they tell us kids grow up so much more quickly today. We have to teach this in kindergarten because kids grow up so much more quickly today. No, they don't. They're just more sophisticated in sin. That's all it is. Good point. So, yeah, that is really something. We've just, uh, we've undercut so much and... I don't know. I just uh, I just finished. Well, really, it was a year ago when I finished it. But I just spent the time to go through Will Durant's uh, uh, history of civilization. He divided it into eleven volumes, by the way. Each one about a thousand pages, so it took a while. But just going back over history itself is just something 
that um, it, let's put it this way. Once you study that type of history, all the civilizations that went forward, they went up to the top and they all went down to the bottom. Uh, and there's always a division on whether we've had, you know, 19 civilizations or 28 or whatever. A point, I think, uh, a point be said 28, but I think Durant is closer to 20. No, nothing has changed, Tamara. Nothing, literally, nothing has changed in all of these years. And that civilization, is a, that civilization that went up, it went up, surely, and then it came down. It went up and down. And now we're in Western civilization. And we're on the downward side, and therefore it's very important because when when civilizations crash, that doesn't mean the end of anything. Saint Augustine was there when Rome fell, and Saint Augustine realized, hey, Rome fell. He was there when uh, when it was sacked in what 410, and then it went totally under in, uh, in uh, what what 30, 40, 50 years later. But he was already instructing his people, look, we have to have a firm foundation, and we're not going to, just because the civil, just because Rome fell doesn't mean that we're falling. And I, I have the same attitude now. When Western civilization falls, Christians should be at the very bottom. In fact, they might be the only ones who know how to read and write, to tell the truth, because right now our kids can't read or write, or they can't think, they, can't, uh, they can hardly do math. And with Common Core, they can't do math, because right. the parents don't even understand it. So um, we have to be wise as serpents. Here's here's what we have to be: harmless as doves, as wise as serpents. And remember that the game plan is for our youth. They think if you're over what uh, thirty, you're already senile and feet in concrete. So we have to take charge, and we have to watch our own young people. We're responsible for our families, and make this uh, and make this civil uh, make this generational thing, and make it a civilization thing as well, yeah. and a Christian thing for sure. You're absolutely right. And, of course, I'm involved in politics, and we need to be active in politics. That That is our stewardship as Christians. God gave us this wonderful system, the best system in the world, but it even is imperfect because humans are involved, and we need to be involved. But D.C. will never save us. Government should not be our God. And you're right, Doc. No matter what type of government we are under, we always have the ability to live as Christians and we know where the spirit of the Lord is. There is Liberty. That's Corinthians. And you talked about civilizations falling. That's scriptural. I believe it's is Ecclesiastes, whatever. There's nothing new under the sun, but I'm going to read what you wrote to me in my understanding, the book, understanding the times book, Zephaniah two, eight through 10. Uh, do you, do you know it? Or do you want me to read it? I'll read Which one it. did you mention there? I just missed that. Zephaniah 2, 8 through 10. I've heard the insults of Moab, the taunts of the Ammonites, who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord God Almighty of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom, the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. That's our hope, isn't it, Doc? And we are right now slouching towards Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where we are right now. In fact, uh, one of the uh, judges, well, who was that, um, wrote the book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. That was uh, 10, 12 years ago, I think. But now we're even closer. In fact, I used to argue, we're not just slouching, we're in downtown part. Oh, right. So we, ha- we have our work cut out for us. We absolutely do. And now I have just a couple minutes left, and I've got to make a couple of announcements for our listeners on this Iran deal. I don't know if you've been paying attention to that, Doc, but uh, if there's a seven-minute video. I have it on Truth For Our Time Facebook page. You need to watch it. Senator Cotton Q&A with Secretary of State Kerry, where the Secretary of State admits he cannot confirm anyone in the department has read those side agreements of this Iran deal. Cannot confirm anyone has read it. Anyone who would be on the behalf of the United States has read it. <laughs> the Ayatollahs have read it, and he trusts the UN, and he trusts the, the IEAU. So, folks, here's the phone number, 202-224-3121, 202-224-3121. Put it in your phone. Keep it all the time. It's the Capitol switchboard. You can call it to reach anyone. Tell them to vote this deal down. Doc, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for what you've done in raising all these kids. We've got to run, but we so, uh, oh, I've got one more minute. Doc, 
You got 30 yes. seconds. What would you like to say to folks on the way out? Well, I don't know. You've said plenty today <laughs> that it's all good. And, um, you know, we just have to bear each other's burdens. And we have to uh, continue to stand fast and firm. We've got to have both feet on the ground. Uh, we have to use our minds that the Lord has given us. We have to have our souls nourished by the Word of God. So there are just a lot of things that we can do as individuals, but we have to, above all, uh, protect our youth. That's absolutely correct. And to know what best to say to you, youth, try reading your Bible yourself. God will reveal things to you. It tells you in Jeremiah, I'll reveal what you do not know. And boy, do we need that help when we're dealing with our youth. For resources, understanding the times, I'm holding it up for those of you who are watching on webcast one live. And tell your friends to listen to the show on 99.3 on noon Sundays. Thank you so much for being with us. It is time to take back our culture by keeping our kids. And you're responsible in that. It's up to you. Be encouraged. Never be complacent.